called Canada's Workers and a Stronger Middle Class. It'll be moderated by your MP for Cape Breton Canso, Roger Kuzner. Joining him is Hassan Youssef, the President of the Canadian Labour Congress, Janet Hazelden, President of the Nova Scotia Nurses Union, and Robert Blakely, the Canadian Operating Officer for Canada's Building Trades Union. Good afternoon, everybody. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed in the home stretch. Um, my, uh, my name is Roger Kuzner. As they had said, uh, we're having a great, uh, great couple of days here. Uh, and this has been my pleasure to uh, be able to host this particular event. If I could start off by just sort of bringing everybody back to uh, a fairly significant date in my life. Uh, it was February 9th, 1988 at the uh, Sydney City Hospital where uh, my first son, Mitchell, was born and I was in the delivery room and I fainted. Um, that was my worst uh, encounter with labor. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't my first though. Uh, I, uh, at St. of X, after my second year, uh, I was taking a BSc in, in, at St. of X and uh, didn't really, uh, I was doing well socially, academically not so much. The Dean of Science thought maybe I should take a little bit of time off. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, with a, uh, a friend of mine, uh, we went out to Fort McMurray and I was fortunate enough at the time to have some friends that were with uh, Leona, Local 92, the International Brotherhood of Laborers, and I was able to uh, uh, join the union there and work on the Suncor project, Great Canadian Oil Sands at the time. So that was my first experience uh, with, uh, with joining a, a union and, and working in a union environment. It was a great... Uh, uh, I continue to keep in touch with a lot of the people that I worked with at the time. And uh, with the union itself, um, it's been great to be able to develop a relationship over the last number of years. Uh, we're here today to talk about labor. Our, our current labor minister, I, I'm so, so fortunate to have the opportunity to work with uh, Minister Patty Haidu. And as you know, Patty is uh, not with us this week, and she's in Calgary, and she's dealing with the labor situation at, uh, at CP with the Teamsters and IBEW and uh, she's on the ground and she got a little bit of movement today and we're hoping that we continue to uh, move that, uh, that situation forward. Uh, anyway, she's doing a great job and she's where she should be and she, and she knows that. She'd love to be here, but she's where she should be. Uh, our approach, uh, I I if I could, before I uh, turn it over to my, uh, I'll do the introductions and uh, turn it over to my panelists here, but, um, as uh, over the last 10 years with uh, Stephen Harper, he decided to pick a fight with organized labor. And uh, as tough as that was on organized labor, it provided us as liberals with a great opportunity. Sometimes as liberals, we cede some real estate and some opportunity to the NDP, and we think that that's the natural uh, neighborhood of the NDP. But in times of strife and in times of challenge and difficulty, uh, People are looking for to, to develop uh, relationships, and we were able to develop that relationship. We we're fortunate; we had the great leadership of uh, Bob Ray in the last years there, and Bob was uh, a tremendous advocate for organized labor, and it allowed us to sort of uh, the, the fight that was picked by the conservatives allowed us to uh, uh, develop a relationship with organized labor, and uh, I, we're, we're going to get some comments on that. Uh, a little bit further down the line, but let me, let, let, I'll get out of the way here. I'm going to introduce our panel, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get the conversation going. And we'll start with the ladies first. Janet Hazelton, she's a Truro native and still living in Truro. Annie Ganesh. Annie Ganesh oh, yeah, that's right. Annie Ganesh born. She's a Saint of Exer. Saint of Ex is in the house. That's the way to go. Bachelor of Science in Nursing, and then she went on and took her Master's in Public Administration at Dal. Uh, and, uh, but she did most of her nursing at the hospital in, uh, in Colchester. So uh, uh, she's uh, the head of the uh, Nova Scotia Nurses Union. Great to have Jana here today. Uh, Bob Lakely 
is the Canadian Operating Officer for the Canada Building Trades Union. Uh, just, uh, he's a great guy. He's, uh, you know, he's a, a plumber, pipe fitter, uh, journeyman, uh, journeyman uh, in Red Seal, uh, plumber and pipe fitter. Uh, he uh, went on and uh, graduated law school at U of A Law. Yeah, and uh, was admitted to the bar in 1978. Um, he said he made more money as a plumber and pipe fitter, but uh, uh, he, he's got uh, a background in the Canadian Armed Forces, the Naval Reserve, and uh, spent a little bit of time here on the uh, East Coast as well, I think, eh? He did, okay, so maybe he'll talk a little bit about that. And we're also fortunate to have Hassan Yosef, and uh, uh, both Hassan and Bob have been, we've been very fortunate to develop great relationships with him, but uh, Hassan is the, uh, uh, immigrated from Guyana, and I had the pleasure to go to Guyana about three years ago, and you're like Elvis down there. The, you know, the, you, you're uh, one, of the, one of their boys that have gone and done so well in this world, and uh, they're very proud of all your accomplishments and what you do for people on a, on a regular basis. Uh, he was the plant chairman at General Motors at the Truck Center and member of the CAW. He was elected CLC president in 2014, re-elected last year. And uh, I, I, oh, the time that I've spent with uh, Hassan and Bob over the last couple of years, they've been very good to us and have offered uh, tremendous advice. And I think in the last uh, platform, we were very fortunate to uh, have the advice as it, as it guided our last platform. Let's start it out, uh, let me throw it out, and we'll go, uh, we'll go ladies first, okay? How about if we do that? Uh, but if you could sort of take a couple of minutes and share with the, the group, with the, the uh, delegation here today, about the change in atmosphere and the change in attitude, uh, compare the 10 years under the past government and uh, the current government and where that's gone, where that relationship has gone since the last election. Janet. So good afternoon. Um, so my name is Janet Hazelton, and I proudly represent about 7,000 nurses in this beautiful province of Nova Scotia. And I must say that over, I've been the president for 12 years, and in those 12 years, I met with um, my MP or the MP for this province in my area, who was conservative once, and it was, it was about uh, Bill 377 to talk about, it was an anti-union bill. Um, recently, I've had the pleasure and opportunity to meet with my MP, Bill Casey, who is the chair of the health care committee, to talk about violence and what, what the federal government can do about violence in our health care system, because it, it is rampant. Uh, nurses and other healthcare workers are hurt more on the job today than a police officer, and that's shameful and unacceptable. We have the right to go to work and come home tired but not injured. So um, I met with Bill Casey and asked him if he would consider, as the chair of the healthcare committee, putting that on the agenda federally so that we can raise awareness, because it's not just Nova Scotian health healthcare workers that are getting injured, it's all over the country. We have nurses that are getting slapped, punched, kicked, spit upon. And it's not just by what you would think patients that have Alzheimer's. This is patients that know what they're doing and do it anyway. This is from, unfortunately, patients' families. I've had a father slap one of my nurses in the face because he didn't like the way his child was being treated. That is not appropriate, not acceptable, and it needs to stop now. So when I met with Mr. Uh, Mr. Casey, he said, so what can we do? One of the things, and, and I had the pleasure of talking to Justin Trudeau last night, and I said to him, you know that there's an aggravated assault charge, criminal, federal criminal charge, if you assault a police officer or a transit worker in this country. And he said, yes, I know, I brought it in. I said, yeah, but what about health care workers? What about health care workers when they get hit, slapped, punched, kicked? What are we going to do about them? And I am not talking about an Alzheimer's patient. I'm talking about a patient that knows what they're doing, or even worse, a family member. So Mr. Casey promised me that he would bring it to the health care committee. And if any of you out there are on the health care committee, I urge you to, to look at this issue and raise awareness. And let's, let's make it 
not be okay. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Bob? Um, you know, Roger outlined something that really matters to me. During the Bill 377, we started to build relationships with the Liberal Party. When the election came, there was actually a Labour section in the platform. That was a revelation, because we hadn't seen that sort of thing before. Once the election was done, the next thing you know, a lot of things in the platform were being enacted. It is not an exaggeration to say that in the first 24 months of this government, they did more for labor, at least for my brand of labor, than the other previous governments of Canada rolled together for the last 24 years had done. That's a big deal. In a number of areas that relate to how are we going to build something? Should we build something? What are we going to do for training? How are we going to get people around the country? Should we have temporary foreign workers? We actually get consulted by the Liberal government. This is a catatonic thing, it, or catastrophic thing, catatonic. I, I am, I'm in a, in a bit of a daze here. Um, this is a big, deal issue. We're not outside with our picket signs hoping that a herd of fleas will infest somebody's armpit. We're actually getting a chance to get our view across to people. It is amazing how different that makes things. Over the last, the course of the last couple of years, Roger, Patty Haidu, the, the minister, some other people who matter in government, have been going to our apprenticeship contests. They've been going to meetings, that be, national meetings of some of the trades, have been talking to people about things that matter. Apprenticeship, we will support apprenticeship. We will give it a better look. We will encourage people into the trade. We'll encourage diversity. We've never seen that before. And if that's, what, if that's what governing the country is about, I'm for it. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Bob. Hassan. Well, after, I mean, for the last nine and a half years under the previous government, uh, the entire period was trying to destroy the labor movement. There's very little that they did in terms of collaborative uh, relationship. And of course, um, uh, to tell you, we spent a great deal of time leading into the last election so they're no longer the government because that kind of behavior and disdain for working people in this country who go out every single day and work to make this country a better place does not uh, bodes well with the labor movement. So of course, we're happy to see them gone. We celebrated that moment, but more importantly, the new government, I think, came into being recognizing fundamentally we had to change the conversation I think as I speak to you today, uh, almost all of our affiliates in the federal jurisdiction have had successful negotiation in their collective agreement. The attack on public sector workers who provide a great public service in this country today is finally respected because the government come to an understanding that we have to respect these workers because they, they day in and day out go and perform vital service to make this country a better place for all of us. And of course, that is something we need to take constantly in the conversation as we govern the country. More importantly, I also want to talk on some of the big issues we got right. Uh, right from the get-go, of course, uh, the government rolled up its sleep and said, listen, you've been campaigning for nine and a half years to expand the Canada Pension Plan. And why is that important? It was important because 11 million people in this country who go to work, as not fortunate as our members are, they don't belong to a pension plan. They are kids, they are grandkids, no fault of their own. We could do better, and of course, what we were able to do is work with Bill Marneau and the Finance Department, along with the government and the provincial and territorial government, and conclude an agreement that will see Canada pension starting to increase by 33% in 2019, and that's going to affect every single Canadian in this country who work and pay into the Canada Pension Plan. <laughs> but at the same time, I think we also took on some of the big issues that we're still working on. 
For decades, it defied our country and why we couldn't come to terms to banning asbestos, one of the most deadly substances humans have ever discovered that killed 2,000 Canadians every single day in this country, every year in this country. This year, the regulations will take into effect for the first time in our history. We're no longer going to export asbestos, and we're no longer going to allow the import of asbestos in our country. And I want to just finish on one important point to, uh, to follow up on what uh, Janet has talked about. Uh, we have been campaigning now for three years to deal with something that quite often we don't think it happens in the workplace, and the workplace don't have anything to do with this. It's domestic violence. We campaign and work with Minister Haidu, of course, to say that we needed to amend the Canada Labour Code. So domestic violence will be something recognized as part of the responsibility of employers for workers who work in their jurisdiction. Most recently, the government, of course, amended the Canada Labour Court to provide for 10 days for domestic violence leaves, and five of those days will be paid leave. Why is that important? If a woman who's been beaten by her partner, abused by her partner, have to go get to change their bank account or to visit a lawyer or to get counseling, why should they be victimized one more time and losing pay from work while they have to go and take care of that responsibility? I think these are the kind of things we have to take on that are fundamental to how we change the relationship between men and women in this country. But more importantly, it is said, employers have responsibility, government have responsibility, and society need to change its attitude as to how we deal with these issues. Because for too long, they've been hidden behind the curtains. It's about time we say we're going to recognize them and treat them as issues in a way that we have to get behind as to how we're going to assist women to truly achieve equality in this country. But more importantly, take on the responsibility as men as to how we fight violence in this country against women. You're never happy, are you? You know, you get this done, this done, this one, but you, there's always something, isn't there? Well, listen, we represent 3.3 million workers in this country, and so long as you're going to govern, there will be things to do. <laughs> one thing about us as a labor movement, we'll never apologize. We didn't go to obedience school. <laughs> and we're going to continue to push the agenda and get used to it. If you want to build a great Canada, you have to do it with working people in this country. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and if you could build a couple of pipelines while you're building the country, it is a nation builder. <laughs> you guys are really working the crowd here. Let's, uh, and I'm just watching this clock, the way it eats down, because I know that there's a couple of things we want to get at, okay? I'll start from the outside, from Bob, and, and work this way. If we could look at what you see as, how about this? If you could give us a couple of things that you think uh, where this government has got it right, and, and Sans mentioned a couple already, a couple of things that we got it right, and then we'll come back and have a next question about uh, a couple things that we, we have to do uh, that, that we can work with organized labor on, on accomplishing in the, in the coming months. Canada has an enormous infrastructure deficit. The infrastructure deficit is in the billions. Here in Halifax, 40% of the water that is purified leaks away because the system is bad. We need to grapple with how infrastructure is going to go, and you've got it right on the community benefits part. You have to hold the feet of the bureaucrats to the fire, I think, and make sure that our tax money, which is invested into infrastructure, does double duty. It needs to build stuff, but it needs to ensure that young Canadians get a chance to get an apprenticeship or some other training opportunity which will lead to a long-term career. It's time for, the time for get a couple of jobs with a wheelbarrow is over. We need people to get careers. And if projects are going past an Indigenous communities area, they deserve a right under the Community Benefits Agreement not to get a couple of paychecks clearing brush, but they need to get an opportunity to build a career. Um, 
first of all, I want to thank the delegates here for recognizing um, and voting for the resolution on a national pharmacare program. As a nurse, um, I look forward to the day that nurses can give a prescription to a patient and know they're going to get it filled and know that they're going to treat their ailment. Too often we have children, for example, that come into our eMERGE departments with a slight wheeze and all they need is a ventilant puffer. That's all they need. But we know that oftentimes parents don't get it filled because they can't afford it. And then we see that child back six, seven, eight hours later in a full-on asthma attack because the parents couldn't afford a $3 ventolin inhaler. However, you have to get it right. You have to roll up your sleeves now. We have to work as Canadians to make sure universal health care, health Medicare, ah, Pharmacare, sorry, uh, comes. There is one thing, though, that um, I've heard my Premier say. When you have political capital, you need to use it. Well, in my view, this government has political capital right now, today, and for the next 18 months. We need to do national pharmacare now, not after the next election, now, today, within the next 18 months. And I commit to this government, I will commit to this government, every union in this country is prepared to help you and to make sure we get it right so that every Canadian, every Canadian, 25 years from now, we'll look at each other and say, do you know there was a time that you had to pay for prescriptions? Just, that, that's what we want our children's children to say. We don't want to be here 20 years from now talking about a national pharmacare. The opportunity is now. We ha you have, we have the political will to do it, so let's get on with it. Thank you. So, back to... Uh Back to organized labor and some of the things that the government has gotten right and where are the, what are the issues we can continue to, where, where the government can work with you to, to improve some of the obstacles you see now. Well, let me start first of all. Um, Minister Haidu is not here, so I want to compliment her for her leadership and her collaborative way of working with, with the labor movement. Uh, she did de deserve a great deal of credit uh, for her consistent uh, respect and relationship that she's built, I think, with the labor movement, recognizing we're not always going to agree, but fundamentally we can find ways to work with each other to advance the agenda on behalf of working people. We've got a number of things right in the last number of years uh, since the government has been elected, but there's, there's always more to do, so I'll touch on them. I want to pick up on Jana's point. I spent the last number of months since last Labor Day, we just completed a 25-city tour talking to our members on a broad coalition about pharmacare. And I could tell you some of the stories I've heard that was simply being tears to your eyes and more, more, more importantly sadden you because the stories I heard from Canadians on this issue is so fundamental. But a country as rich as ours when so many people, no fault of their own, can get the medication they need to get well. This is an issue we can work together. It's about the future of our country. It's about productivity. It's about competitiveness. But more importantly, it's about completing the job we didn't get right in the last 50 years when we established our healthcare system. We're one of the only OECD countries still don't have pharmacare as part of our healthcare system. And this is the moment for us to collaborate to make it happen and make sure it happens soon. So those of you who are still voting on the resolution, I'll urge you to vote in support of it. The next thing I want to talk on is the pay equity. You know, it's 2018 and women who work in the federal public sector, uh, federal jurisdiction still don't have proactive pay equity legislation to give them real equality when they go to work. We don't have to wait another year because these women, if they're going to have real equality in Canada, they need to start with economic equality by paying them the same we pay men for doing the same job in this country. I think we can work together, of course, to complete that task. And more importantly, it's the right thing to do. The more money that women have, the better lives they would have. And more importantly, their kids and their families would have a better life. Last thing I want to touch on, Roger is that 
we all hear these stories and we park them because they think it doesn't have anything to do. I think our bankruptcy legislation in this country is inadequate. We just watched as Sears, something that we have known as a brand in this country, an iconic brand that we have all patronized. Sears declared bankruptcy, and you watch some of those workers who spent decades helped building that company and was very profitable, of only to be told to go stand at the back of the line, of course, to figure out where they fit in in terms of the bankruptcy of the assets of that company. Our bankruptcy laws, of course, don't treat workers fairly in this country. We have a responsibility to fix that because what is it about? It's about the saying the people who make sure those companies were profitable should not have to stand the indignity and waiting at the back of the line to find out about their pension. Bob. On, on, on Hassan's last point, I'd like you to ask yourself a question. Who do you think is better able to protect themselves when a major corporation goes bankrupt? The bank that knows everything about that financial corporation, all its transaction and what it does, or the little 62-year-old lady at the cash register making minimum wage? If you think it's the bank that can protect themselves, give the little old lady a break. We had a, uh, thanks so much for those comments. The, uh, we, had, we had a great event last night. Um, many of you were here last night for the uh, discussion that uh, David Axelrod and, uh, and Jerry Butts had. And uh, I, I thought it was, it was open, it was frank, it was candid. Uh, there were a couple of points that really stuck with me. There were, the one that really, you know, I, I, I think, uh, made an impression was the fact that we're all here as liberals and we're engaged in the process because we believe in the, in the process and we believe in our country, but we do what we do, not just to win the day, not just to win an election or win government. We do what we do so that we can help people grow and, and build and contribute to society and, and, and that's, that's what motivates us so that we can help others. Um, I would, um, I, I like your two cents. I, I think over the course of the last uh, conservative majority uh, government, uh, when they really did take on organized labor, and, and they poked the bear, they woke uh, organized labor up and you know everybody was pretty much engaged we can't take that for granted what can we do if we want to continue to close the gap between the haves and have-nots not just make it about the have-mores if we want to uh, give all Canadians uh, an opportunity at success how can we work with organized labor what can we do with organized labor to make sure that that happens? How can, how, how can we uh, count on organized labor to help us help you? So if I can start with Jan, and we'll come to the sand and finish up with Bob. I think one of the things that, that you're doing correctly is a panel like this, where you know leaders of labor are at a national convention of liberals to hear our opinions on things. When I've heard a lot over the last few days about democracy. And the previous government, democracy is not surrounding yourself with people that think the same as you do. Democracy is when you surround yourself with people like organized labor and business and others and take into account what decision, the decisions you make are going to affect Canadians. And you need our input. You need Canadians' input, and having panels such as this, taking meetings with us, hearing our opinions on things, having, being available when we lobby on the Hill, making my members feel welcome when they knock on your door or come to see you, that's the start. You know, Labour is not here to fight government. We want to work with governments. We have the same goal as every one of you. We want the best country and province we can. Our Canadians, our children that I'm looking at, they deserve this. They deserve the very best Canada that we have. And 
We, the labor movement, need to be part of the conversation because if we're not included, our voices will be heard. You might as well listen to us and invite us into the meetings. <laughs> Sam. Well, I think that, you know, as a movement, we've always recognized it's a two-way street. And fundamentally, if we're going to have a relationship, it has to be based on respect. We speak on behalf of our members, and we expect weekly for the government to be listening to those uh, uh, concerns that we bring. But at the end of the day, we want to ensure this country of ours, where the, the wealth that we all generate is shared among many, not just a few. And fundamentally, we have to have an economy to work for working people. We can't simply pretend that things the way they are is, is going to be maintained. Our country is changing at an alarming rate, which we should welcome. I came to this country as a young immigrant. Did I ever believe any time in my life I would become the president of the Canadian Labour Congress, an organization that represents some 3.3 million workers? No. But our values as such, where I don't feel I'm an immigrant in this country, I'm not an immigrant, I'm a Canadian. I'm also a trade union leader. My values start from the people I respect, and I speak on their behalf every day. I know with ministers and bureaucrats that I meet with all the time, there is an understanding that labor is a partner with this government. We're not always going to agree on the issues, but fundamentally, it's critical that, the, starting from the Prime Minister down, what is the respect, that we have to engage them in the conversation as we are talking about renegotiation of NAFTA, one of the central questions, what is the opinion of the labor movement about the renegotiations of NAFTA? Hey, listen, we've had some grievances on the NAFTA agreement. Can we improve it? But if we're not invited to be part of that, then you're simply going to continue with the same mistakes as made in the past. There are many challenges that our country face, but fundamentally at the heart of any government, how do we help the citizens of our country who don't have the wherewithal so they can have a better life. And I'm gonna tell you one story. My mom will be 94 years of age this year. And in the first budget the government brought down, they did a very important thing, was part of our work in the Congress. How can we, of course, increase GIS payment to allow those who are the poorest citizens in our country to have a better life? She got over a $73 and something cents increase in her GIS check. The government spent some $800 million, affecting mostly single women. I can tell you, every penny that my mom got from her GIS check increase went right back in the economy. She helped make this country a great place, and she deserved every penny she got. And as a taxpayer, by the way, I'm proud of the fact that she was a priority in the government's budget, because those poor citizens in this country are the ones we need to keep at the heart of the decisions we make, because it is important that we find a way to ensure that we don't have any citizens in our country who have helped build this nation to remain poor. And that was a great decision. I think we can do more, but fundamentally it starts by respecting the labor movement and agree to work in a collaborative manner. Just before I go to Bob, um, you've got my cell phone number in your phone? You got Patty's? Yes. Um, you got uh, Minister Champagne's? And Scott Bryson's. Uh, Morneau's? Yes. Justin's? Uh, not quite. He has some checks and balances. <laughs> so, so we're working on Justin's. That's not bad access. But by the way, they also have mine. What? <laughs> <laughs> Robert. I don't have a stinking cell phone. <laughs> yeah. Robert still believes that post-it notes are high-tech, so he's, he's sort of an off-the-grid kind of guy. Um, I really had to think about the question you posed. I think there's something that you need to keep doing, which you have made a very good start on as a government. That is valuing and investing in the Canadian workforce. You know, our industry construction 1.2 million people, it's a big deal in terms of employment. It is 12% of the GDP and about 9% of all direct employment in Canada. We are going to lose 248,500 people through retirement when the baby boom generation hits the road, 
No one ever thought the baby boom was leaving, but they're leaving. We have to replace those people. The only way we're going to do that is to bring in bright young women. You figured that out and you spent some money on that. Do we have an industry challenge in going from being big, mean, and smell bad to let's do this smart? Yeah, that's a challenge, but it's one we can overcome. You've supported female apprentices and other STEM occupations. You've supported a way to get training going. Training actually matters. If we're going to meet the challenge of tomorrow, people need to invest in the workforce. Things as simple as some of the changes that have happened with EI. Can the person who is taking a two-week program, which will get them a job, get EI for training? Well, we couldn't a little while ago. We can now. The workforce and investing in skills, in creating skills that will endure and building careers, keep doing that because that's going to make an enormous difference to Canada. We're sort of winding down, uh, and uh, I'm going to ask each of the panelists if you want to take uh, a minute or two minutes to sort of wrap up with uh, some final comments uh, before we take it home. But there's been, been some great points brought forward, and uh, if we could start with that, we'll go ladies first again, okay? Uh. So. First of all, it's been a privilege to be here for, for me, for sure. Um, and I think the most important issue facing our healthcare system right now is, is our injury rate. Um, I think, and it's not just the violence, it's healthcare workers are injured uh, lifts, lifting patients and moving patients. And we have to take a serious look at our healthcare system and try and make sure we look after the people working in the system. Um, we can no longer afford to have the amount of healthcare workers off that we have off in this country. So we need to take a serious look at our healthcare system, how we can improve it, and how can we keep our healthcare workers safe at work so that they can go home and enjoy their families just like you have the privilege. A week from today is April 28th, uh, our day of mourning, and we need to honour those that died on the job. But we also have to protect those that are still there going to work each and every day. So uh, if, if anything, I, I think over the next few years, we need to, to look at, at our public systems and make sure that our workers are kept safe. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Robert? If we're going to succeed, we have to have an economy that's prosperous. It means we need to do things like approve projects in a timely way. It doesn't matter what side of the issue you're on, you should get your innings, you should get your chance to say something, then a decision should get made. Decision having been made, let's build the damn thing. The, at, at the end of the day, Capital flees from here, and it goes somewhere else. You know, in British Columbia, we've been talking about LNGs now for about 10 years. We haven't put a single shovel in the ground. At the same time, people in Australia and the people in Louisiana and Mississippi started talking about it, they've been shipping product for years. We're losing the window. We need to find some ways to do that. We need to ensure that we are planning and executing on our economy. Thank you, Bob. Well, uh, Roger, let me first uh, uh, start by thanking you and colleagues for um, taking the risk of inviting me to be here. Um, <laughs> Uh, we work on uh, many issues. As you know, the Canadian Labour Congress has some 56 affiliates uh, representing some 3.3 million members, so there's always some issues that are going to, um, uh, we're going to work on that's going to be challenging. But what we have learned, I think, in regards to our relationship, 
is based on the fact that we will talk about whatever those issues are and try to figure out how we can improve both our relationship but also how we can do better even when we don't get it right. That's nine-tenths of what I think, uh, what has built this relationship so far and will keep it going. But as we go forward, as like all of us, our country, of course, is like many others, we're facing many, many challenges. And we now have the luxury, of course, turning the clock back. Climate change is one of those issues that we are going to be struggling with as a nation because we have a role. This is about the future of humanity. And we don't get the luxury of simply burying our head. This coming week, of course, the government is going to announce very quickly a just, a just Transitions Task Force, how we deal with coal workers are going to be phased out. This is a very important thing, but at the heart of the Just Transition Task Force, of course, is workers and communities. And I'm proud to say this has been good work because, again, it reinforced the fact that we can work to get this right, that we shut down our coal fire plants and how we transition workers to some future employment. At the same time, not lose sight of the community. So thank you so much for that collaborative approach because that's what has made this relationship what it is. Thank you so much. Great. If I, if I could close on, uh, on this and in, in, in thanking my, uh, my colleagues um, and our guests here today, uh, our platform was rich with, in, in the last election, it was rich with what we wanted to do for the middle class and those working hard to join it. You may have heard that a few times from our leader. Uh, it's because that's what we were committed to. Organized labor in this country has been committed to those principles of fair wages, of worker safety, of benefits, of a oneness in the workplace. They've been committed to that for years. So our, our goal is similar. Our goal is the same. And over the last number of years, Hassan talks about relationships. It is about relationships. We've been able to do, I, I, I'm confident that our relationship with organized labor is one of respect, is one of trust, and it's one that is truly appreciated by this party and by this government. I want to make sure you as liberals understand that and coming into the next election, do not cede any ground to the new Democratic Party. Know that we may not be the cheerleaders for organized labor, neither are we their enemy. But we know that if we show them the respect and the trust and we work together and we show that we appreciate their contribution to this country, then we all end up winning and Canadians end up winning. Thank you so much for being here today with us.